Welcome back, everyone, to the Disaster Tough Podcast, where we share insights into the big plays and right calls of leadership. We dive deep into the stories, lessons learned, and ideas that will help you in the field. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. I just had a great, like, five, ten minute conversation with Judd before we even started. I was like, oh, no, we should be recording this. He has so much experience all across the field. When we talk about getting out there and being able to know your job, it was so easy for him, even in the beginning, to walk through all the different experiences he's done. So I'm definitely going to ask him to do it again. But from our perspective in emergency services and trying to make that disaster tough call, you know, there's so many conflicting things that happen. To be able to interview somebody who has a ton of experience in um, in the military side, in the public side, and working through natural and man-made incidents, as well as, of course, war. It's incredibly special to have somebody like uh, Judd Mathus on here. And so, uh, you know, when we talk to him, uh, please just keep in mind of what you can do in your field, whether you're a firefighter, if you're an emergency manager, or if you're in the military, the lessons he's going to be providing to you will make you exponentially better. This guy has so much experience we're really lucky to have him on the show. So with that uh, being said, Judd, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John. I'm, uh, I'm, thanks for that introduction, too. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And hopefully uh, I can, I can uh, leave your listeners with something that they can get some utility out of that's, that's value added to their, uh, you know, to, to whatever they do in emergency management or consequence management and, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm really, I'm super excited to be here. Well, uh, not to use a WMD bun, but I'm pretty sure you're going to blow everybody away. So uh, we're excited for the, for the episode here. Let's talk about some of your experience. You really have done basically everything under the sun. And you shared a couple with, the, with, a couple with me from riots to WMD to, you know, the, the, the war landscape. Can you walk through, just for the sake of our audience, what your a very storied career includes. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and date myself. I graduated high school in 1986 and I joined the Louisiana national guard. And, um, I was not, it was my first, I guess, first day on the job. The first weekend that we had a, an assembly, um, mm-hmm. we called them drills and there was a riot at the, uh, Internet, um, immigration and naturalization uh, services prison in Oakdale, Louisiana. Sure. And that was the beginning of, you know, kind of the civil support, domestic operations, DISCA, and uh, for your, um, so DISCA means different things to different people. Uh, we think it stands for defense support to civil authorities. The folks at DOD that do security cooperation thinks it stands for the defense security cooperation agency. Both very important. However, when I say this guy, I'm talking about the fit support to civil authorities. Uh, and then living in Louisiana, I mean, it's it's the disaster du jour, right? It's um, mostly uh, tropical weather, hurricanes. But I mean, if you think about, it doesn't even have to be a hurricane. You know, a tropical storm off the off the uh, Gulf Coast. If if tropical storm winds. Uh, hit New Orleans, for example, which is in between the Gulf of Mexico and like Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River, you're going to have flooding, you know, and, yeah. and um, d- dealing with flooding in a, in, a, in a city that's 13 feet below sea level uh, is uh, a, a daunting task. Uh, and then, you know, at, at the policy and strategy, uh, well, I went on active duty in uh, 2002 uh, because of 9-11, um, deployed several times, I think six year six years in total to Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Um, but I did get to work at the, the policy and, and strategy level at headquarters DA and then at National Guard Bureau. So, um, and then it, you know, uh, 2020 was a, uh, probably the year of the most national guard utilization for consequence management, emergency management, disc uh, dom ops. We had 120,000 national guardsmen on duty at the time working everything from, 
hurricanes. Remember, there were two uh, Cat 5 hurricanes that hit the coast of Louisiana in the same spot, Lake Charles, yeah. which is where I'm from. <laughs> That's where I was born and raised. Um, uh, maybe I'm just bad luck. But anyway, but then the, the, the wildfires that year were were unprecedented. And then the civil unrest, starting with the George Floyd riots mm-hmm. to what happened um, post uh, January 6th, as far as the, the presence that the National Guard at one time had up to 23,000 um, service members on the streets of D.C. Not all at the same time, obviously. Right. But, um, uh, so... Yeah, I think I've pretty much... You've, you've gone the gamut. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue, and collapse and confined structures. This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. If you served in the military, you've probably worn Proper Apparel. Proper Apparel is now reaching out to first responders and those who love the outdoors. Check out Proper Apparel from the outdoors to the EOC, wear proper. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. You know, it, 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 and I asked this question to uh, then Colonel McKinney, who's General McKinney now, and uh, big shout out to him and UCOM. Hopefully he's doing well. But, um, you know, the National Guard has such, and I think I brought this up to um, Erica Borderman too, on the podcast. Now, she was very opposite because her dad was military and she didn't want to be a military. But the National Guard gets involved in so many of our uh, disaster responses in the U.S., and yet the relationship between the National Guard and uh, civil is, for a good reason, a couple degrees removed. But I feel like there's so many lessons learned that we could learn from each other. As a National Guardsman, as going out there and dealing with so many different incident types, not just the natural hazard stuff, but the man-made stuff as well, what are some of the big lessons learned that you were like, oh, I wish those emergency managers from the other side of the house would would learn this about either military or about the National Guard specifically? Like, what lessons could we gain that you have implemented well on your side of the house? Well, I mean, a couple. Um, and, and there's more than a couple. But, I mean, the, the two that I've always lamented over was interoperability. Yeah. You know, um, and we've done, I mean, we've made, uh, gigantic strides with regard to interoperability, how our tactical communication systems and radios can talk to say like a state police smart radio, you know, the, mm-hmm. um, uh, interoperability, um, interagency coordination prior to D-Day, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, left of D-Day, H hour, um, D-Day is not the, the, yeah, that's. I know you've heard this. Uh, it's it's that's not the time to be exchanging business cards. Um, so you know, how do you get around that? Well, exercises, and they don't have to be large scale exercises like NLEs, national level exercises. I know that you know there are some municipalities that do every year they do local exercises, and you know there's. There, there's there's two things and they're not dichotomous but they're they are really different so you, you have governors and look the governor's in charge of the state i don't care what the flavor of disaster is what the level of response is that governor's in charge you know if you want to go in there you need to go in there the right way you got to get his permission yeah you know it's like the marines landing at, at uh long island during you know, super sore of Sandy and, you know, the tag at the time, um, just basically said, we, we love to have you guys here, but go away and come back the right way. You know, let us know what, yeah. you know, so that, that, that interagency coordination left of D-Day. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that can be accomplished through a lot of different things. Um, exercises is, is just one of them. Um, yeah. It's my favorite way, honestly. Uh, the exercises piece is such a 
it's it, it it's a simple way to get in the mud with somebody without having to get in the mud with somebody and you know just having some kind of experience where you can bond over something is infinitely better than nothing honestly and you don't have to exercise all your capabilities you can focus on um communications i mean or it can be a tabletop exercise is a tabletop exercise where you're just moving pieces around on his chessboard but they are they are invaluable and i and i don't know of anything um you know, that provides more utility and more value to interagency cooperation and the coordination that you're talking about. And that will reduce those degrees of separation between, you know, state uh, emergency managers and state emergency response personnel and federal emergency response personnel, i.e. FEMA, um, yeah. DHS, and the National Guard, because the National Guard operates under some pretty broad and pretty unique authorities. I mean, there, there's not a whole lot they can't do. In other words, they're not statutorily restricted by, say, U.S. Title 10, which is the Department of Defense. Mm-hmm. Title 32, which is National Guard, allows them to basically support just about any other agency that's operating under any other title and authority without, you know, getting, you know, uh, in trouble for, you know, purpose of violation for using equipment um, or, you know, they can operate in state active duty, which is just kind of unlimited. I mean, you're only limited by your resources, you know, and, and, and your state budget. And you're not even limited there because every state's constitution has emergency management assistance compacts in there. And those things are worked out way left of D-Day between governors and their oh. adjutant generals and their emergency managers where, Look, if Louisiana's got a, a tropical storm in the Gulf and it's about to cross that imaginary line that runs from the Yucatan Peninsula to the tip of Florida, there are forces mustering all around the country right. to 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 launch. Um, so that's the third thing I'd say is understanding the titles and authorities and the capabilities under which the, the, the national guard operates and what they bring to the table and understanding that they may be first in, but they need to be first out as well. Yeah. Because good point. You don't want, I mean, cause I was involved in, you um, guys are expensive. Real talk. Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're expensive, but it's look, I, I would live in a country where I can look across the street and not see a guy in uniform walk around with right. That's just not, it's not a good optic. I mean, that's not an American optic, right? So you want to be, you want to enable those civil authorities as fast as you can and get back to what you were doing before D-Day. I think you just figured out the title of our episode, by the way, American Optics. That's cool. That's to be the title of your next book. I don't know if you're writing about but the, uh, you know, when we get in there and, uh, you know, Hurricane Harvey, there was an incident where, I wouldn't say incident, it's probably not the right word for it. Um, there was an opportunity for uh, an external partner to learn about the Stafford Act. And I was young and uh, they had all the, you know, the medals on the chest, the whole deal. And guess what? Stafford Act is still a thing. When FEMA gets in there and it has certain authorities, learning about everybody's authorities and and what they can do is uh, invaluable to help ease things over because at the end of the day, people have to be able to make decisions. At the same time, the biggest thing that gets involved, uh, the biggest problem in every single disaster is personality. Every single time. If you can get uh, people to be on the same page and same mission and the same goals, uh, people stop bringing up um, authorities once they understand what those authorities are. They stop asking for things that they shouldn't ask for. At the same time, they want to be able to help out. And, um, man, the, the training piece is unique because, uh, with the readiness lab, we provide, I want to say it's a monopoly. It's unintentionally a monopoly, but we provide a training with DOD, with DHS, uh, with emergency management, with a bunch of other people. We call it dynamic populations. A lot of my audience knows what it is. Um, essentially we do a counterterrorism training. And we put them in a location where they don't have any legal authority. They have all the responsibility as the emergency manager, but no legal authorities. And so how do you 
do that relationship. It basically forces people through a leadership mechanism of getting people on your side and working through puzzle pieces rather than making demands of things that you shouldn't be making demands for. So by the time they go back to their job and they do have the authorities, then they're able to uh, work in together. But the problem with the dynamic populations course, as well as all other trainings, when I was in the public side, I don't know if you felt this way too, training was always the first thing that was cut on a budget item every single time. It was like, oh, you know, this is this is extra. And I figure, like, you know, our skills are diminishing skills. If you're not training, if you're not doing the interoperability, you know, in Blue Sky, if you're not training, then what are you doing? I don't know. It, it's, it's a point of contention for me. I, I, I hope as people listen, they're like, oh, you know, Judd's saying it, John's saying it, other people are saying it. Training is so invaluable, and yet, uh, for some reason, we can't get over that hump. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. I'll uh, I'll uh, quote uh, the the, the three hundred movie. The more you 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 sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. Oh, uh, I like that. <laughs> in training, you know, the the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. Um, yeah. it's 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 so true. And you know, you talk about group dynamics, and you know those the stages of of group dynamics. You know the the what is it the uh, norming, uh, storming, forming, and performing. We don't have time for that. That's why you got, you know, you know, that's why you, you know, you, to your point about personalities, I mean, there's really, there's no time for that. And, and you talked about the Stafford Act, you know, once there's been a, a declaration of emergency, a disaster declaration, I mean, I'm not saying that the, this, the, that the Stafford Act is automatic, but I, I can't remember a time in recent history where it wasn't automatic. Sure. You know, and, and, but the thing about the Stafford Act is it's reimbursable 100% up to a certain time horizon. Mm-hmm. Yes. Those right are the disaster. You know, right of disaster. So, right of D Day. And so, you, you really need to do those things, those important things that require interagency cooperation as fast as you can and up front because the bills the bill for the state starts increasing after a certain amount of time you know and, and so you don't want to be wasting time you know like i said wasting time exchanging business cards and working through personalities and again training and exercises i think is the the best way uh to have that interagency cooperation and form those relationships, you know, because a lot of, you know, the military guys were just, well, I retired, but I mean, yeah, you should say this about the uniform folks. They are, we're all just passing through. I mean, we're going to be there two, three years tops, Yeah, but a lot of those guys, especially those you know, uh, GS employees, well, you know, um, DOD uh, civilians or DHS civilians, I mean, those guys have been there forever. You know, and sometimes um, to my chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, it's like Time to move on, man. Yeah, they get famous, right? Even you hear the you hear this one person's name and you just cringe. Yep. Uh but you know, the the value of and there's no forcing function for their in agency. Hmm. George Bush tried to uh George Bush forty one tried to appoint an interagency czar. And it just didn't work. And it didn't work because of, of law, titles and authorities and funding streams. You know, I guess if the closest I can think of to an interagency czar is, is the National Security Advisor at the National Security Council, you know, because he's got those principles, you know, the, all those cabinet secretaries in one room, on, hmm. but he can't force them to do anything. I mean, he doesn't, yeah. that's, that's the limit of his authority. He can convene them. You know, and make suggestions, but um, it's a simple thing to say. But I think interagency cooperation is done over a cup of coffee. You know, hundred percent. I and, have I I go for meals. Uh, if I can get a if I can get a meal with somebody, game over. Be, you know, and people forget this about training. Training is not always just about training competency. Training is about relationships, figuring out what people tick. It, you know, people will complain sometimes like, oh, that person's so incompetent. They don't know their job. 
I'm glad you figured that out. Now, how do you work with that person? Because you still have to work with them, right? And so, you know, I the it, it's it's kind of a, a funny topic because there's so many people in our field. I'm the same way. We're all A type. We want to get done. We want at the end of the day, mission success, right? Like it's all about mission success. You know, whatever that mission is. And yet, it's not the A-type personality stuff that gets uh, things moving in a disaster. It's the text message. It's the phone call. It's the walking over to your buddy and say, hey, like, I was just told that we couldn't get these helicopters. Is there anything you can do for me? You know what? I know you. I'm going to hook you up. You know, like, whatever that is, you know, the relationships uh, mean so much. And I've said this a few times on the podcast I'm going to say it again. The day I read an after action report that doesn't have communications on it, the day I get to retire from this podcast, like I'm so like we we can figure this out. Right. And it does take the training piece. It does take those other things from a from a guy from a response perspective, just kind of like moving into that world a little bit in in some of the disasters that you've been in, whether it's man made or otherwise. What were some of the key takeaways for you? Like, what are the big highlights in your career where, like, that event changed my career because of X? Like, do you have, like, two or three of those events where, you know, it was game changer for you? Like, what were the those events and the, the lessons learned there? Um, Yeah, and I'll just give you my top three. And, and, and getting back to what you said about relationships, I, I've said this in several different forums uh, in, in, in mixed company. When it comes to interagency cooperation and, and domestic response, disaster response, consequence management, relationships are the center of gravity. I mean, that, that is the cog of, of that. I mean, it doesn't matter what capabilities any agency brings to the table. Does it bring resources, money, you name it. Whatever means they have does not matter as much as it does the relationships. Yeah. Then the communication, it's got to be flat. You know, they're... Yeah, you got to check your personality at the door, and we and for reasons we just talked about, sometimes that's difficult. I would say um, Katrina and Rita hmm. uh, was where we learned probably the most in the last three, four decades about emergency management, consequence management, because you really didn't. I wouldn't say you would have you had a you didn't have an existential, I guess it depends on who you ask whether it was an existential threat event by the, you know, the loss of life, the loss of infrastructure, the loss of, um, supply chain, all all situational awareness when there's zero situational awareness, you know, when every command center is underwater, And oh, by the way, you got another hurricane bearing down, you know, a little bit further to the West. You know, you learn a lot about how to manage resources and and how to resource constrain and then how to prioritize and how to redefine what an emergency is, you know, because and the other thing, you know, that we learned about Katrina is, you know, the accounting and fiscal piece of it. And I'll give you an example. Um, The state of Louisiana got a million dollar bill. That's a million Uh dollar bill from the pot of gold chemical toilet company in New Orleans, Louisiana for portalettes that they had dropped around the city Mm. that were just there and just stayed there. And, but the bill came after they collected them all up. So no one can even remember if some of them were there. Or not. Oh, no. The same with light sets. You know, light sets were the coin of the realm. Then. Yeah. And, you know, they were laying all over the place. And, you know, I remember being at Bell Chase, Louisiana. Hmm. And a C-130 landed. And they rolled off 13 Humvees. And the load master threw me a set of keys and said, good luck, buddy. And got back on that C-130 and took off. I mean, there was, there was not even a 2062, which is a temporary hand receipt, much less a lateral transfer order. 
you know, so the, the, the accounting piece of it, it's, it seems like the least of your worries at the time, but you better bring in some bean counters, uh, at the beginning of the disaster, because that is, I mean, we're probably still paying some of the bills here almost 20 years later. You know, when you consider that next year, will August the 19th of 2025 will be the 20th anniversary of, of Katrina. You just dated and, me a little bit with the 20th. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the other, um, big takeaway I think is from the, the, the George Floyd riots and what we learned about de-escalation and the, the way that you present forces in an area of operations is going to have a direct impact on being able to de-escalate. If you show up looking like, you know, the stormtroopers, you know, on the Death Star, you know, fully kitted up, you know, armed to the teeth with with a short rifle, with a sidearm, with the right shield, with a baton, and and looking like, you know, you're, you're going to go freaking kill them. Yeah. You're about to, you're, yeah. Look, you look like you're about to halo into Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, that is no way to de escalate a situation. Um, so I have found that the, that the protective posture that the, and I understand you got to protect your guys. You do. I mean, you got to keep them safe from harm, but the less they look like military, Mm -hmm. um, the, the better. And I, and I will, so I, I know, um, you remember the, there were some, some riots in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And um, they weren't mad at the military. They were mad at civil authorities. So why not place the military in front of the civil authorities? Yeah. You know, and let them interact with the crowd instead of putting the people that they're pissed off. Um, I don't know if I can say that on the show. You can. You're good. Yeah. People that they're upset with out front. Yeah, I understand the military shouldn't be in the lead. No, that's unnatural. But think about the situation. You know, they weren't mad at the military. And so what we did is we put guys, they weren't fully kitted up. But the, the folks that were rioting looked across the street or across the skirmish line, and there's the guy that they work with at Walmart. Yeah. You know, do they really want to break bad with that guy? Do they really want to hit that guy with a brick or a Molotov cocktail? Absolutely not. It de-escalated the situation so quickly, you know, by by putting the guard out front because it was the police that they were pissed off at, you know. So that's another huge takeaway. Um, and then I would say the third was the capital response, you know, the the buildup of forces in 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 DC um after uh the, the January sixth incident. Um in that we learned real quickly how precious few transportation assets there are in in the DOD inventory. And I'm talking about things that are managed by transcom and I'm not talking about just you know, gray tails, uh, or, or, you know, ships, I'm talking about the, the commercial assets as well. And, you know, we still had some stuff going on in the world. So you, you, you run into a simultaneity problem. You know, we have a simultaneous, whatever you want to call it, unprecedented period of civil unrest in the United States, but oh, by the way, we're still operating in the sitcom AOR in Afghanistan and Kuwait and in Iraq and in, in, in Syria, you know, and you've got to get those guys and those assets where they need to be when they need to be there. A hundred percent. And so, you know, um, and I know the people that write the National Defense Authorization Act and then the Defense Appropriations, they know this stuff. You know, I, I've said this, you know, uh, you can have all the disaster response you can afford. 
And, and, you know, uh, you, you know, that's why we talk about the Stafford Act and the Economy Act. Yeah, it, it helps when you can open up some coffers and you can open up some purses of money that can be transferred between agencies by some mechanism, in this case, the, the Stafford Act, the Economy Act. But those are the three big disasters and the, are the three big events and the, and the biggest takeaways from each one. The de-escalation thing, I think, is um, incredibly fa- fascinating. You have worked in, and I'm, I'm giving some of the secret sauce away a little bit, but you've worked in so many uh, different types of mitigation, mitigations of things, mitigations of problems, mitigations of people, and... Um, the, there's a buzzword, and I'm sure you know it, and this is really more for the field, but everybody brings up resiliency. Yeah. And uh, I get a lot of flack on my show because people are like, oh, resiliency is so important. I believe in resiliency. I don't want to have to be resilient. I don't want to have to bounce back. And uh, I would rather deal with mitigation, mitigation first. And if you know, if we're outside of a response, even in a response, mitigation in my world is king. The faster I can mitigate problems, the faster I can find solutions and overcome the solutions, you know, it, just like with training and how, you know, it's better to, what did you say, bleed in the training ground versus bleed on the battlefield or whatever? Sweat. Uh, sweat. 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 Yeah. Sweat. Yeah. Training, so bleed sweat in and training. It's the same thing with mitigation from a mitigation standpoint of things, of people, of situations. Um, do you subscribe to that same kind of concept that it's better to mitigate than to be resilient? I mean, obviously they're, they're both important. We, I don't want to get rid of either one, but from a guy who's focused a lot on mitigation, where can we be better at mitigating things, people, or problems? I think it's a sliding scale. You know, the more mitigation you do, the less resilient you have to be, or the more mitigation you do, the more resilient you are. Ooh, I like that. Yes, um, yes. We're going to go with that one because then nobody has to give me crap for it anymore. The more you the, mitigate, uh, the more it's, uh, it's, you're resilient. Yeah, but it's a sliding scale or you know, it's it's the more prepared you are, the the less you have to pay for on the back end. And resilience wasn't really a buzz word until the 2017 National Security Strategy when they talked about you know, these shocks to the system, these unanticipated, like, like a cyber nine eleven. you know, and we've done so much since then in the, in the cyber realm, because, you know, we think that's where the, the, the next existential threat will come from. I don't, I don't think that people realize and they, as they shouldn't, I mean, no one thinks about this stuff. I mean, people, you know, they say all politics is local. You know, the, where I live in Louisiana, they don't want a whole lot. They just want low taxes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, but you what, you know, with my background in, in space and counting weapons of mass destruction, you know, I hate to quote uh, Donald Rumsfeld, but he talked about the, you know, the, the black swans and the unknowable unknown. He said, there's unknowns that you know about, and then there's unknowns that you can't possibly anticipate. And there's a, there's a book I would recommend to your listener. Can I do that? Can I recommend? Yeah. hundred percent. Please. Of course. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's called the gray rhino and it's, and it's, no one can predict the future, but the gray rhino and, uh, but you can anticipate surprises. And you do that by doing vulnerability assessments. I don't know if we've done a vulnerability assessment of our critical infrastructure, but it, I, look, I will scare anybody or be doom and gloom or, you know, the sky is falling, but I've been part of some TTXs at the U S army war college when they took down the dominion power grid, which serves about 4 million people. Yeah, the number of folks that die in after twenty four hours because their insulin goes bad is astronomical. You know, yeah. So, what investments are we making right now? I mean, it's it's great to talk about okay, how are we going to come back from this shock? 
But why not talk about how can we avoid it all together? Or how can we fortify, fortify ourselves against this shock? You know, how can we mitigate it? Um, but, you know, it, in our lexicon, in, in, in you know, the, the disaster management lexicon, we want to talk about mitigation. You know, you know uh, the problem with mitigation and emergency management right now, and I've been beating people over the head with this, and quite frankly, I've had three FEMA admins on the podcast to talk about it. Too many emergency managers do mitigation after the big response. They have a huge hurricane and they're like, oh, great. Now it's in time to enact my hazard mitigation plan and try to get grants. Like, you did it wrong. You know, the, the hazard vulnerability assessments, by the way, I just did a really cool one uh, for the Portland Timber Soccer Stadium. That was really fun. But like those... That's when that's like you should be your your foundation for all everything, your plans, your mitigation, your resource allocation, your training schedule. You could do all of that, and yet too many people are like, "Well, I don't know if I can convince my boss to get these new cameras or to harden these systems or whatever." We'll just see what happens, and it's always more expensive. It's a bigger headache, and people got hurt. So, like, what are we doing? You know, like we need to overcome that a little bit. Well, and, you know, again, you know, I guess we'll always come back to the value of training and exercises, but a lot of times you can tease out those vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. Well, I would say that's the whole point of the exercise in a lot of cases. Yes, to build interoperability and build cooperation um, and rehearse your, your, your H hour sequence, but it's, it's also to tease out, you know, the, your blind spots. And your and your capabilities gaps. Yeah. And then once you, once you've teased out your blind spots and your capabilities gaps in an exercise, that's when the hard work, in my opinion, starts. And it's it's mitigating those gaps. Yeah. In what whatever capability it is, and we're talking about you know people, time, and money, a lot of times, but a, you know other resources as well. You know, and, and people don't want to have those conversations because one, they're hard and two, you talk, you know, you get into, especially if you do an eight, AT, um, an annual an, uh, anti-terrorism assessment on a facility, you know, yeah, you could, I mean, you can start spending some money and I'm not talking about a Lowe's or Home Depot either. You know, you're talking about technology that is expensive, but yeah, you know, what is, what is the risk reward calculus that you're doing? And, and. I don't, you know, we as, and it's a good thing that it is an American way of thinking to favor worst case scenario. I mean, we, we, we favor worst case scenario. Um, but it's also the most expensive way to think, you know, um, we don't allow like, you know, real politic to creep into these discussions. Um, because then they would overwhelm and dominate the discussion, you know, if you, you know, but you can't plan in a, in a, in a resource unconstrained environment, you have a finite set of means, you know, what your objectives are. It's just, how do you marry those two things up? Mm-hmm. And, you know, what are the shortfalls and what, are, what's the risk represented by those shortfalls? And if it's, you know, if it's unacceptable risk, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to resource constrain. In other words, there's some things that you're going to not do because you're using resources for that activity to pay for, a, a, you know, your, your capabilities gaps. So, and, and brother, that is strategy. Yeah. <laughs> you have ends and you have means and the way you marry those two things up is strategy, but you can't just do it in a resource of constrained way. You have to weigh it against risk, i.e. you're never going to have enough resources. So what do you do? You either adjust your ends, your objectives, and you scale those down or you limit them, or you increase your means. And again, the only way you're going to increase means these days is to rob Peter. You know, so yeah. what's the oppor- what's the opportunity cost involved? In other words, what are we not going to do because we're moving money or we're moving resources? Um, but the 
the tough conversations with regard to mitigation, th- that to me, that's like a never ending OODA loop. You know, yeah. it's, 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 you know, and it's, it's 360 degree assessments constantly. And I don't think we have, I think we, we lack uh, the expertise because what you said earlier and um, look, it hit me with the subtly of a sledgehammer is it these skills that we're building as emergency managers atrophy. Yeah. If, you know, and we don't want to exercise them or we don't want to, we don't want to be working out in the disaster. We want to, you know, we, we want to exercise those things. Um, so we don't lose those skills because they are perishable, you know, uh-huh. but, but also the education piece, you know, we talked about small space rescue, that school in Oklahoma for small space rescue is not cheap. Yeah. Like what's, what's the value of a human life, you know, and that, and that's kind of a red herring argument. I'm not trying to appeal to anyone. Depends who you ask. You ask my wife and me, <laughs> uh, you know, my kids, they're worth a lot more than me. Yeah. I mean, and it's, that's not a red herring argument at all. I'm not yeah. trying to appeal to anybody. I'm just saying that, you know, it, if we want to do this right, we're going to have to make some hard decisions. And, you know, it's 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 a risk reward calculus. You know, it's is the juice worth the squeeze. It's a cost benefit analysis. Um, but it's 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 the part of consequence management and disaster management and disaster response that I, it's you, you can't you can't have enough of these conversations, the, the, the kind of conversations that you and I are having now, because you got to keep it in the forefront of the national strategic narrative. You know, we, do we have a national strategic narrative? I don't know. But if we, if, if we do, uh, we've got to be talking about how we resource defending the homeland, securing the homeland, responding to uh, natural and man-made disasters. And mitigation, you know, because I don't want to find out how resilient I am. I don't want to find out how resilient the society is that I live in, the, the urban center or the town or the state or whatever. I want to go to bed at night knowing that we've done everything we can to ensure that we are resilient. That's right. I I have no desire to test my resiliency. <laughs> I want my kids to have fun at the playground i want to pick them up from school i want to i want to hang out with them and uh you know from a guy who focuses so much on disasters and i'm kind of a disaster geek i i get into it and i have fun with it in in a weird ways a lot of people don't probably can understand at the same time uh i don't want to experience them i want i want to look at that tornado when it goes by my house and think wow that looks really cool instead of oh my gosh what is happening you know, and there's so much of the natural hazard stuff that we could mitigate. There's a lot of the man-made stuff that we could mitigate. And, you know, um, gosh, I'm going to get on my soapbox and I don't want to do this too because we're out of time. But, you know, uh, some of those things are obvious and some of them are not. And funny enough, I have found in my own life, going back full circle here, like the 360 optics here, American optics, uh, you know, the relationship thing, being kind to people giving people the better of the doubt, a willing to train them, willing to work with them has, it has an incredible, uh, effect to de-escalate problems, you know, showing up in a polo shirt without riot gear, man, or just a t-shirt, whatever fatigues, whatever it may be, can do more for stopping problems than anything else. We just did an active shooter training in, um, in Portland and we were talking about de-escalation and people don't realize how many active shooters come from the organizations where they worked. They always think it's some Hollywood thing where it's some bystander. No, it's because people are ignoring other people around them. So from us, from I want to say small scale, but from an immediate threat uh, analysis of an active shooter all the way through the huge stuff, it does come down to people coming down to working and uh, and to reaching out and, and doing those things and. For that being said, you know, Judd, I will give you the last comments here, but for my end, you know, thank you so much for coming on and sharing those insights with me. I, you know, I appreciate that. And the fact that you called me brother, I always tell people if a military guy says brother, 
then you know you're on the in crowd. So, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show. Talking with it you. is a term of endearment for me because I'm one of eight children. And Holy I've cow. Got, I've got five brothers. And look, I've never had to go outside my family for much. So if, if I call you brother, you, you, you're definitely in the club. You're We're in the, the club. club. Awesome. Why, to your, to your last point, I tell people there's no maximum effective range for please and thank you. Those are, I mean, it costs you nothing. And, and what you get, it, it's, it's like you said, having manners, being polite. Yeah. You know, when I was still in uniform, people would tell me that I should be a professional in processor because every time I got to a new job, I was like shovel ready on day two, mm-hmm. you know, where everyone else was like in processing for two weeks, sometimes even a month just to get accounts set up. And right. everyone always asked me, how do you do it? I mean, are you related to everybody in the department of defense? I'm like, no, I'm like, you would not believe how far, please and thank you will go especially the beltway i mean in the pentagon where they won't even tell you when they won't even they won't even say good morning when you pass them in the hall or if if you say good morning they you know I'm like, what the hell um it's like what's so, wrong <laughs> yeah so i mean the, your 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 final point maybe the most important point of this entire podcast is you know be a good person be a good human being you know, please and thank you and have manners and respect, you know. And when I was growing up, we were in a, we had a class. Uh, I went to parochial school, but it was after recess and it was a good, it was a good time to have it. It was called politeness hmm. because we had been out on the schoolyard brawling and fighting and, and, and raising hell and pulling the girl's hair. And so we had politeness class afterwards. And, and to this day, I know how to set the table where the salad fork is all the way on the outside and the soup spoons on the opposite side, because I went through politeness class. Hmm. Politeness is a lost art and manners. And, but it's, it just comes down to being a good person, like you said. And, you know, uh, I'll leave you with this. Abraham Lincoln said the fastest way to make an enemy into a friend is to ask him for a favor. Hmm. Like so that. when I'm in some of these interagency meetings and then there's this one guy that's just dominating, he's the SCS or the GS 15 that has uh, more degrees than a thermometer with some whiz kid from Stanford or Harvard or uh, MIT I'll just ask that person for a favor or ask him or her for some advice. You would be shocked how fast you win them over. You have a friend for life at a lot of times and they'll do anything for you. Yeah. So yeah, your last point, I think may be the most important point of the entire podcast. I don't know if I made the point so much as you made the point. So we'll, well, maybe we'll share credit on that one. Uh, you know, and I, I said, I was, wasn't going to talk anymore, but I'm going to say one more thing. Thank you for coming on to the podcast and uh, for accepting the invite. I was raised to always say please and thank you and sir and ma'am, and I still believe those are polite things. And, um, you know, treating people with dignity and respect. You know, every every person on earth, if they just treat everybody with a little more dignity and respect, even if they think they're below them, which is BS, there's no, there's no such thing as that, you know, it would move mountains. It was, so many problems would just go away with with that. So, uh, then, Jeff, thank, thank you again for for coming on for taking the time with me. Um, for everybody who's tuning in, thank you. This is like the thank you now the podcast. Uh, thank you for for tuning in. If you want to say thank you to Judd, the easiest ways to do that you got a couple different ways. You got to give us a five star rating and subscribe. Of course, we say that every time. But if you got something out of this podcast, send us a message. We'll pass it on to Judd. Uh, you can put it on uh, social media. You can ask your questions there. If you have found a way that you have overcome, you know, uh, issues in your job, we would love to know what those are. And uh, make sure you keep tuning in. Again, social media for Disaster Tough Podcast. Send us a message if you want to talk with Judd. And, uh, of course, we got to give a shout-out to Pat Mahaney and uh, Chris DeRuder and um, John Spencer. We, we brought him up before. So good, guys. Pat. 
There you go. There was the bad thing. So, um, and uh, we'll see you for the next one. Peace.